William Shakespeare is the greatest playwright of all time, but was he also a secret Catholic? That's the topic for today on today's Crisis Point. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and editor chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started, I just want to encourage people to uh, hit the like button, to subscribe, and to let other people know about it. I really do appreciate that. Well, we have a returning guest who's an expert on this topic, and that's Joseph Pierce. He is a native of England and a contributing editor of Crisis Magazine and the internationally acclaimed author of many books, which include bestsellers such as Tolkien, Man and Myth, The Unmasking of Oscar Wilde, C.S. Lewis and the Catholic Church, Literary Converts, Wisdom and Innocence, A Life of G.K. Chesterton, Solzhenitsyn, A Soul in Exile, which is what we talked about last time we had him on the podcast, and then the topic of today's podcast, which is The Quest for Shakespeare, The Bard of Avon, and The Church of Rome. Welcome to the program, Joseph. It's good to be back, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I was telling you beforehand, I would just let everybody know, this is really a topic that has gained a lot of interest with me because I really started reading Shakespeare this summer after being woefully uneducated in, in The Great Bard. And so I, I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. But then I, as I was reading and studying about him, I started to find out, wow, there's actually a pretty decent segment number of people who believe that he was Catholic, which I had honestly never heard before. And then I saw that you had actually written a book about it. And I was like, and I actually, you mentioned it in uh, Faith of Our Fathers, your, your new book from Ignatius about the history of England. And so I was like, okay, I got to find out more about this. And so and like most people, like I said, I did not even know anybody thought that he was Catholic. I'd never heard this when I grew growing up in high, my public high school, when we read, had to read some Shakespeare, never heard that. So what is the common belief among most kind of Shakespearean scholars today about uh, Shakespeare's religious beliefs? Well, first of all, Eric, I would say that like you, uh, I was uh, had no idea about Shakespeare's Catholicism. And when I first moved to the United States back in 2001, one of my colleagues at Ave Maria, um, uh, another literature person, Ave Maria, was saying that Shakespeare was a Catholic, and I sort of smiled, probably <laughs> superciliously, uh, and said, well, that's just wishful thinking. We don't know enough about Shakespeare to have any real idea what his religious beliefs were. The only, uh, the only honest position to hold is one of agnosticism, not his agnosticism, but our agnosticism with respect to we don't know uh, uh, what his beliefs were. And then since then, of course, as my books uh, testify, I've, I've, I've uh, come across so much evidence that I think we can show beyond any reasonable doubt that he was a Catholic. But so that obviously isn't the view of, of, of most people. And what we have to understand is that Shakespeare lived in very anti-Catholic times. And then there was a period of a century or so after his death when he wasn't the celebrity he became. There was a great Catholic revival in the 18th century, so in the 1700s, where all of a sudden he became a celebrity and a, you know, the greatest Englishman. But by that time, of course, 150 years have passed since his death. Uh, and England had become even more anti-Catholic uh, culturally than it was when he was alive. Uh, and so insofar as his faith was remembered at all, and for the most part it wasn't, uh, it was certainly not going to be mentioned. And it was only until a, a century or so after that, in the 19th century, with scholars such as uh, Richard Simpson and others, that evidence for Shakespeare's Catholicism began to emerge. And then since then, we've had 150 years of good, solid scholarship, which is what I've built my own books up, upon. OK, OK. So most people, most uh, kind of scholars today that would probably just say that we don't really know his religious beliefs and perhaps he was even a bit anti-religious. Is that kind of the common uh, consensus among a lot of scholars or have even non-Catholic scholars started to say, yeah, he possibly was Catholic. Have they started to see that way? Well, uh, to take the first part of your question first, uh, a lot of the belief that Shakespeare was anti-religious or anti-Christian is based upon a misreading of the plays. In other words, that moderns, uh, the, the modern and postmodern academy being divorced from any context, being having no theology, no philosophy and no history, uh, have no way of actually reading the plays in any objective sense. So they they, they, they come to the plays with their own prejudice, their own pride and prejudice, and have, have those, that pride and prejudice mirrored back to them. They see what they want to see, and therefore they come to a, a Shakespeare made in their own image. That sort of 
radical relativistic reading of the plays does not hold up when we do know uh, a theology, philosophy, and history. So that's the, the the first thing I would say. And having said that, I've forgotten the second half of your question. <laughs> has there been any has there been any development among scholarship to say to to admit that perhaps there is evidence for his Catholicism? Yes, uh, the 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 uh, the evidence for Shakespeare's Catholicism has been gaining traction even in the the secular world. So it's not just a preserve for for, for Catholics now. My favorite story in this regard was something I was told by someone who was attending a lecture by the director of the National Shakespeare Theatre uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and his lecture was on something completely unrelated to Shakespeare's faith. But during the Q&A, someone asked the question, well, what about Shakespeare's religious beliefs? What were they? And he responded instantly, well, many people think he was Catholic. Hmm. So that that's a sort of, if you like, a, a mainstream secular response when asked the question directly, unexpectedly, that's the response. And I think it's just acknowledgement that insofar as we have evidence, the evidence is overwhelming that he was a Catholic. OK, so the reason why it's uh, we're unsure, it's not concrete and definitive in a lot of ways is because of times he was living in. So why don't you kind of paint a picture of the England in which Shakespeare lived. Yeah, so for people that know more about the history of the 20th century than I do about the, uh, the 16th and 17th century, a good analogy would be the Soviet Union and life uh, 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 under the Soviet terror. Obviously, if you're a dissident living uh, under the yoke of communism, you don't leave a paper trail behind you because if you did, you'd end up in the gulag. So it's the same thing in Shakespeare's England. So. During Shakespeare's life, uh, he, he lived during the reign of two monarchs, uh, Elizabeth I and James I. During the entirety of his life, except for a very brief period of about a year after James I came to the, the, the throne, and we could talk about that if you like later, but the, the, with that very small exception, the, the whole of his life, the Catholic Church was illegal. Illegal to such a degree that the, the mass was outlawed, uh, to be a priest in England was punishable by death. To harbour a priest in England was to be punishable by death. And we have uh, between the 1530s with the martyrdom um, of the, uh, the, the Carthusians and then St Thomas More and St John Fisher in the 1530s under the reign of Henry VIII until the final, uh, the final martyrdoms in the 1680s. So a period of 150 years in which Catholic priests and laity were being put to death for their faith. It's right in the middle of that period. So you know, if this period of persecution begins in the 1530s and ends in the 1680s, Shakespeare's writing from about 1590 until about 1612. So really right in the middle of that period of persecution. So obviously he's not going to be writing letters to everybody about his Catholic faith because that would be uh, basically putting his head on the block. Right. And I think that's something we should remember when we look back at historically, we know the names of the great uh, martyrs of the day, the great recusants like uh, Edmund Campion, people like that. And we also know the names of a lot of the people who, who went uh, to Elizabeth's religion and, and rejected the Catholic faith were traitors to it. But the fact is, is that most people we don't really know what they were because it was kind of a mess on the ground, wasn't it? As far as like, how, you know. One family might have people that are practicing, but they're not letting anybody know about it, where another one might go to the local Anglican church, but they are actually still believe themselves to be Catholic. And there's a lot of different ways in which people, Catholics tried to survive during that time, right? Yeah, basically during Shakespeare's time, particularly during uh, the early part of Shakespeare's writing, the, the tide was turning against Catholicism while he was writing. Um, but Certainly in the 1590s and the late years of Elizabeth's reign, the majority of the people in England were still by uh, sensibility, certainly, and by uh, belief, uh, largely uh, Catholic. So this very large part of the population, possibly the majority, but certainly a very large part of the population, uh, they, they expressed their Catholicism in three distinct ways. There were the what I call the church conformists. So they were um, because it, you, you were fined if you did not attend the services of the state religion, uh, the service of the Anglican Church. If you didn't attend at least a certain number of times a year, you were fined. So the church conformists uh, outwardly conformed. 
They went to the Anglican services at least as often as they had to, but uh, but moaned uh, and groaned uh, about um, uh, the new religion and, and, and longed for a return of the good old days. And then you had the church papists. This was the term given to them by their enemies, the church papists, who lived a double life. So they would be outwardly conforming in order to avoid paying the fines. Or at least one member of the family would be outwardly conforming, the, the, the husband, to avoid paying the fines. Uh, and then, but they would also be secretly practicing Catholics when there's a priest in a the neighborhood. They would they would uh, go to mass and receive the other sacraments. So they would be living a double life. And then the third group are the recusants, those who recused, those who refused to conform, who refused to go to the Anglican services, and in consequence paid huge fines. Um, and I can't remember what the main uh, cause of revenue for the Elizabethan government was, but the second largest source of revenue for the Elizabethan government was the money, the income from fines levied on recusant Catholics. So that's how big an issue this was. And just to conclude, we know that Shakespeare's mother's family were um, the Ardens were one of the most uh, notorious uh, recusant families in the whole of England. And we know that Shakespeare's father was fined for his recusancy. And so was his Shakespeare's daughter, Susanna. So we have this, um, uh, the, insofar as we know anything about Shakespeare's family, we know they were in not just, they weren't just Catholics, they were part of that most devoutly militant and defiant section of the Catholic population. Okay, so let's talk then a little bit about Shakespeare's upbringing and how that reflects the potential that he was uh, Catholic himself. You mentioned his father, you mentioned his mother's family. So how was he raised? And also, I, I know, for example, the school he went to, likely went to as a young boy, a lot of the teachers seemed to end up becoming Catholic priests or becoming somehow associated with the recusant movement. So tell us a little bit about his upbringing. Well, the first thing we, we, we need to realize, of course, that he was raised in the, the Warwickshire town of Stratford-upon-Avon. Uh, and at that period, Warwickshire in general, and Stratford in particular, was a, a town which was still predominantly Catholic. In other words, the majority of the population were Catholic. You know this from all sorts of government reports. So Shakespeare, we know Shakespeare's family were Catholic. Shake, that, that, that the, uh, the grammar school he went to, on the assumption he went there, um, uh, because we don't have record of where he had his education, in theory, he could have done what uh, many other Catholics did and actually went abroad to study um we don't we don't know basically but if it's more the most likely scenario is that he went to the local grammar school and as you rightly say at least one of the teachers there at the time went on to become a priest um and to actually be martyred uh, upon his return to england we know of uh, uh, other teachers that were also catholics and and ended up falling foul of the law so Shakespeare was living in a predominantly Catholic community where the teaching staff and the students at the local school were predominantly Catholic. Now, he was baptized though in the Anglican Church. I know some people have said that's evidence that his father and mother weren't practicing Catholics, no matter what else we might say. What, what, do, you, what do you say in response to that? Well, what you have to understand uh, is that if someone is not baptized in the state religion, then they are illegitimate. They have no rights to uh, to property. They have no rights, no, no legal status. So just as when we get married uh, in these days, we might get married in the church, but we have to register our marriage with the secular authorities. It was exactly the same there. So baptism and funerals and weddings uh, had to take place in the uh, the state religion there was no 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 way around that and we know for instance in stratford upon avon churchyard and shakespeare's actually buried in the church but in the anglican church there um there are many known recusant catholics buried in the churchyard i mean where else is someone going to be buried you have to be buried in the uh consecrated churchyard of your local parish church that's part of the state structure so it means nothing the fact that shakespeare was baptized according to the secular law of the land okay okay now what is it i know that it, it's his father i think who seems to have the, the most evidence of being explicitly a recusant uh what what is the, what is the evidence of his father john and exactly why is it we think that he was definitely catholic well there are two pieces of documentary evidence that that, that uh, uh make it absolutely abundantly clear that he was a catholic the first is the the fact that in 1592 
He was fined as a Catholic recusant. And by this, but by this stage, Shakespeare's living in London and writing his early plays. So that's when his father is fined for his Catholic recusancy. In 1606, the year in which Shakespeare is writing plays such as Macbeth, uh, his daughter Susanna is fined for her recusancy. And then uh, about 150 years after Shakespeare's death in the 1700s, there was some building work, some renovation work being done on the Shakespeare family home. And as they were working on the roof, they discovered hidden, concealed in the rafters, uh, a document that obviously been hidden there, uh, presumably for fear of its being discovered. Uh, and that was the last will and testament, that's sorry, the spiritual last will and testament of John Shakespeare. Now, we need to make make this clear, it was the spiritual last will and testament, not the legal last will and testament. And there's a great story behind this, because basically what this says is that I want it to be known that I'm a Catholic, and I want it to be known if there's no priest uh, uh, available when I die, that I wished to die in the, uh, the, in, in the Catholic faith, we're uh, fortified by the sacraments of the church, including extreme unction, etc. Um, so it's this statement of his faith. And it's what I sometimes call it's it's an extreme unction of desire. Yeah, we know about baptism of desire, what have you, because of course the reality in England at the time was that because it was illegal to be a priest, because the Catholic Church was illegal, there was no guarantee that you would have access to a priest uh, in extremis uh, at the point of death. So these these uh, spiritual last will and testaments actually there's a whole history behind them. It's fascinating. If you don't mind my. Uh, giving some more meat to the bones. Oh, yeah, definitely. It was authored, this spiritual last and testament, this is great detective scholarly work done by, I think, Father Thurston, a Jesuit, and others in the early 20th century, that this spiritual last and testament was actually written by Sir Charles Borromeo, uh, the uh, Cardinal Archbishop uh, of Milan, um, and a saint, of course, and he wrote it during the plague uh, that hit Milan, uh, because the same, same problem, People were dying in such numbers that it was impossible for the priest to minister to the, to the sick and dying. So he just wrote this and printed this spiritual last and testament that's then handed out to the people so they could sign it as a way of uh, an affirmation of their desire for a priest. So when St. Edmund Campion and his companions are on their way to England to their martyrdom in 1580, they go, they, they, they go from Rome to England overland by land. And they stop in Milan. Uh, and as St. Charles Borromeo's invitation, they stay with him. And it's almost certainly then that these copies of the spiritual last and testament were handed to St. Edmund Campion and his companions uh, and came to England. We have a, a letter written by uh, a Jesuit in England, I can't remember which one at the moment, to Claude Acquaviva, the, the superior general of the Jesuits in Rome, asking for more copies of the Testaments because many people desire them. And for many years, it was thought this applied, this meant the new Douay Reims New Testament. But there's two reasons why it can't be that. First of all, these priests are, are living uh, uh, you know, as sort of God's spies, to, to pluck a phrase from Shakespeare, uh, traveling surreptitiously, the very thought that they'd be carrying bulky copies of the of the New Testament with them is, uh, is absurd. It'd be, it would be suicide, where it's much more easy to conceal a two or three page printed uh, sheet. Um, but the other reason it can't be the Douay Reims New Testament is at this, the date of this letter um, is actually several months before the publication of the first edition and it, uh, of the Douay Reims, and it's asking for more copies of the testament so quite clearly these were these were testaments smuggled into the country by by jesuit priests and others that were then handed out to recusant catholics obviously at some point shakespeare's father and family was sufficiently worried about the house being raided that they hid the document in the rafters of the roof where it remained to be discovered 150 years later that's that's amazing. Now, is it is it possible that uh, either John Shakespeare or his son William actually met or knew uh, Saint Edmund Campion himself? Yes, there is there there is certainly circumstantial evidence that some some secular scholars have have taken seriously um, uh, that 
Shakespeare would have met him when Shakespeare was a, a, a teenager. So let, the evidence for that is that we know that when St. Edmund Campion came to England and he was only at liberty for about a year before he was captured, tortured and uh, martyred. But he passed through or within a few miles of Stratford-upon-Avon and met local records and families while he was there. So there's every possibility that Shakespeare's family, uh, Shakespeare's father, perhaps Shakespeare himself, would have met uh, St Edmund Campion as he passed north uh, on his way to Lancashire from, from London. But also uh, we know that there was a period of time when Shakespeare, the young Shakespeare, uh, had to leave Stratford-upon-Avon in a hurry having uh, all we know is he fell foul of the lord of the manor who was a, a, a rabidly anti-catholic who uh relished the, the overseeing the raiding of catholic homes so we know that shakespeare fell out with this man and had to leave in a hurry and for some years we know he he took he was a schoolmaster in the country and that would really mean probably that he was basically homeschooling the uh the children of uh, of catholic records and families and there's someone called uh, William Shake Sharp, who's an actor, who's staying uh, in a Rexon home in Lancashire at the same time that Edmund Campion is staying in a neighbouring Rexon home. Uh, and it's conjectured that they may well have met. And, there's, and so Edmund Campion had written plays while he was a Jesuit in Prague. Uh, and so we have you know, this playwright, this seasoned, mature, very holy, very erudite. He was, he was, he was the, the Newman of his age. He was, right. was a great scholar uh, with this sort of a teenage Shakespeare sort of at his knee learning the, the trade, so to speak. But it's speculative. What I, would, what I normally emphasize, it, the, my book, um, uh, Shakespeare on Love, I think, has a whole appendix uh, called The Jesuit Connection. Uh, and I, I put more emphasis upon the absolutely solid evidence that Shakespeare would have known another Jesuit martyr, that's St. Robert Southall or St. Robert Southwell, if you prefer, who was basically uh, ministering in London at the same time that Shakespeare was in London. And Shakespeare's uh, patron, the Earl of Southampton, who was a recusant Catholic, uh, had St. Robert Southall as his personal confessor. So in this relatively small, you know, this is the heart of the beast, the Catholics in London, um, that I, I find it, and, and, and we know that Sir Robert Southern alludes to and refers to Shakespeare's work, and we know that in several places, in The Merchant of Venice, uh, in um, uh, Hamlet, uh, the whole of the, well, the large part of the famous Alas Poor Yorick scene in Hamlet is basically quoting almost directly from St. Robert Southall's poem, Upon the Image of Death. So for me, they certainly knew each other's work and almost certainly knew each other personally. And it's not in, not in the least unlikely that Sir Robert Southall could have been Shakespeare's confessor. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, you can, you can make a movie about this where you have like the young Shakespeare learning some of the trade from St. Edmund Campion. And I mean, it's just, you know, all and, and these priests that are be, basically being hunted. And that's amazing. So now, OK, so. Aside from his family, the evidence and his raising things like that, and setting aside for the moment the evidence from his plays themselves, do we have any other biographical evidence from Shakespeare's life itself? Any evidence from him himself that he was a Catholic? Yeah, there, I mean, there's several pieces of documentary evidence which we can go on. Some, sometimes the documentary evidence is what's there, and sometimes the documentary, entry, documentary evidence is what's not there. So I'll begin with that. Um, for instance, there's no record of William Shakespeare uh, attending any Anglican church in the area which we know he lived uh, around the Globe Theatre, just south of the river. Um, there are many records of his friends and colleagues who he worked with uh, attending Anglican services at th th this church and neighbouring churches. No record at all of Shakespeare attending these services. So, of course, the secular scholars say this proves he had no religion. Whereas, of course, the logical conclusion is he's not attending Anglican services for the same reason his father isn't, for the same reason his mother isn't, and for the same reason his daughter isn't, because he's a recusant Catholic. Um, and even the fact he lodged in a Huguenot home, which is sometimes taken as evidence as a Protestant, is uh, an example of his uh, avoiding fines. The Huguenots were exempt from att attending Anglican services. 
they had a privileged position in that. So if he was lodging in the house of Huguenots, he did not have to pay fines for not attending the Anglican services. So that's um, the evidence on that level. Another piece of evidence, uh, and then I'll come to the strongest piece after that, is that he was fined. Um, uh, he was charged with um, uh, threatening uh, to to uh, harm, to 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 kill uh, two people, uh, Shakespeare, along with three or four co-defendants. Now, this is very interesting uh, because uh, the two people who he threatened to harm threatened violence against were known priest hunters. And we have reports from them where they boast of raiding Catholic homes in London, where Shakespeare was living, removing crucifixes and papist books and other Catholic paraphernalia and making a public bonfire on the street outside the house. We have reports of them gloating about this. These are the people who Shakespeare has as enemies that take him to court for threatening them. Uh, and Shakespeare's co-defendants are known Catholic recusants. So this, again, is, is further evidence. But the strongest evidence is the basically the final thing that we know that Shakespeare did before retiring at the end of his playwriting career and returning for the last couple of years of his life, uh, last three or four years of his life to Stratford-upon-Avon. The last thing he did was to buy the Blackfriars Gatehouse to purchase the Blackfriars Gatehouse. And again, secular biographers say, well, as he was planning to leave London, this was clearly just an investment, right? Purely a financial investment. Well, that's intriguing because if Shakespeare had the money to buy such a large house uh, as an investment, why had he not bothered to invest in property prior to that? The only, he had money because he bought for his own family in Stratford, the second largest house in Stratford. Um, so he buys this house, uh, but not, not with the intention of living in it. He, he leaves London. What is this house? Well, the Blackfriars Gatehouse, as the name would suggest, was the gatehouse to Blackfriars, the Dominican house in London, which was obviously destroyed in the 1530s with all the other uh, monasteries and religious houses in England by Henry VIII. But we have the property deeds of every owner from the time of the dissolution of the monasteries until Shakespeare purchases it 80 years later. 75 years later um, and every owner of the gate, Blackfriars Gate House is a known Catholic hmm. furthermore the Blackfriars Gate House is a known hub for uh, underground Catholic activity in London the house is raided on more than one occasion there are reports of secret passageways down to the river allowing people to make a quick escape there are reports of a Jesuit priest being pursued knocking frantically on the door to be allowed in um, this is the house that Shakespeare purchases. Um, and not only does he do that, he stipulates that, that the present tenant who lived in it before he purchases it should remain as the tenant. This is someone called John Robinson, who's the only one of Shakespeare's London friends who is close enough to Shakespeare to be with Shakespeare in Stratford during Shakespeare's final illness and signs his will. Uh, in the same year in which Shakespeare buys the Blackfriars Gate House and stipulates that John Robinson must remain as the tenant, John Robinson's brother enters the English College in Rome to study for the priesthood. So again, we, all the documentary evidence we have, as regards legal documentation and other things, points inescapably to the fact that Shakespeare was a Catholic. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a lot of evidence right there. Now, that, so that's, that's like biographical evidence of his uh, being Catholic. What about the evidence from the plays themselves? Obviously, the, what we know most about Shakespeare is the plays. In fact, that's kind of what people say is like you don't hardly know anything about his, his life. But we know, of course, about his writings. So from his writings, what evidence do we have uh, that he was that he was a secret Catholic? Yeah. So basically, my work on Shakespeare has has it began with the biographical evidence. That was the first book. And I've written two other books and also introductions to various the plays and the Ignatius Critical Editions. Um, and the way I see this is that the two the two types of, of evidence are form a gothic art. So you have the biographical evidence and then the textual evidence from the plays. And the two sort of su are mutually supportive, like a gothic arch that hold each other up. So the first thing, of course, is we do have to know something about the, the times in which Shakespeare lived uh, and uh, what was going on to, to, to understand the plays on a deeper level. 
we can so we can be three 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 or four centuries removed or we can try to get close all right so when we do that we see all sorts of evidence i don't so much so i don't really know where to begin but let's begin with with hamlet um so hamlet is written right at the end of the reign of queen elizabeth the first um sh either shortly before or shortly after the essex rebellion uh in which shakespeare's um uh, uh, patron, the Earl of Southampton, was a leader and was actually sent to the Tower of London. The Earl of Essex, the leader, was executed. The Earl of Southampton was sent to the Tower of London for his part. So this, the, Hamlet's a very angry play. Um, and it's, it's a, a place that's very antagonistic and angry towards, first of all, a usurping monarch and, and the, 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 the official Catholic position from, from documents such as from St. Pius V is that the true the true Queen of England was Mary Stuart, uh, Mary Queen of Scots, who had been killed, presumably on Elizabeth I's orders. And upon her death, her son, James VI of Scotland, who would become James I of England following Elizabeth's death, was the true heir. So a lot of Shakespeare's plays during the reign of Elizabeth were about usurping monarchs. So you have King Claudius, who kills the true king um, uh, and has a spy network around him. And what you have to understand in England, the Catholics lived in fear of Elizabeth's spy network because they, 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 were, they were bogus, uh, fake conversions uh, in order to, for, for spies to get in. There were also blackmail where Catholics were basically put in positions where they could be blackmailed and then they were uh, the source of information that way. So Catholics didn't know who to trust. So that, that Hamlet's all about spies. It's about um, Polonius as the spy master. That would be um, uh, um, uh, William Cecil, the uh, Elizabeth's spy master. Um, and so we, we see here the anger against spies. There's also a very strong defense of the Catholic uh, theology of uh, um, uh, against uh, sola fide, that you need both uh, uh, faith and works. Uh, we see that at the beginning of the play in, in the discourse about the insist upon, insistence upon praying on the sword and not merely by faith alone. Again, as I've mentioned already, the famous graveyard scene upon the image of death um, uh, relates to uh, uh, plucks lines from uh, St. Robert Suttle's poet poem upon the image of death. Uh, and there's a mention of the queen, Queen Gertrude, being painted, ha having uh, uh, cosmetics an inch thick over her. And this, everybody was laughing at Elizabeth I at this point because she had white paint to cover all of her uh, signs of aging. So she had this sort of white mask on all the time. And the, the, the phrase, I can't quote it exactly, unfortunately, but you no, know, that she's going to come to this. She's going to come to death. It doesn't matter how much makeup she wears. And of course, it's ostensibly talking about Queen Gertrude, but Shakespeare and his audience would know very well that um, that he's talking about Queen Elizabeth I. Um, that's one example. I don't know if you want to ask another question. I could go on to King Lear. You know, let's go. Let's move on to King Lear. I'm actually that's what I'm reading right now. So let's hear that one. <laughs> well, again, the, the 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 situation at the beginning of the play that sets up the drama is exactly the situation that Catholics find found themselves in England, that the king says you have to love me all. In other words, you love the monarch, you love the state above all else. So he has three daughters, uh, Goneril and Regan lie. <laughs> they tell him that he's he's the only thing in the world that he's. Uh, you know, he's basically he's their God uh, and they worship him and their reward is, to, is, is, is secular advancement. Right. They get their share of the kingdom. But the daughter who really loves him, uh, Cordelia, uh, re refuses her choice is to love and be silent. In other words, in order to love the king, uh, one must actually refuse when the king is doing things which are wrong. And therefore, not just harmful to the state, but harmful to the king himself. So she chooses to refuse. She, she's a recusant. And it's in her recusancy she's then exiled from the country, actually to France, which is where many of the exiles went. Um, and, uh, of course, we, then Regan and Gonville are only interested in, in, in being self-serving. Self, self there are lots of other things I could say, but my favourite part 
um, is one of the most beautiful speeches in the play towards the end um, of the play is um, uh, the calm lets away to prison speech when uh, King Lear says to Cordelia, he's deliriously happy, even though they're both about to be put to death, he's <laughs> deliriously happy because they're reunited. Um, uh, and she forgives him. Uh, and he says, come, let's away to prison. And it's this wonderful speech. But in the middle of, midst of it, he says, we can laugh at, at, at those gilded butterflies, you know, the courtiers, those that care about the king and the court. Um, um, uh, we, 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 we will basically pray for each other and bless each other, forgive each other. And then he says, and we will be as God's spies. Mm. Now, two things about that. Of course, the priests and Catholics in general in England were God's spies because they had to live uh, secretly from the eye of the state, the secular power. But there's also a wonderful poem by Sir Robert Southall called Decease Release. And it's written about uh, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, and it's in the voice of Mary, Queen of Scots, on the eve of her execution. And, and, and in that, the whole imagery is she, in being crushed, uh, she would be like incense that rises like a pleasing fragrance to heaven. And she said, there's a phrase in it, I will be as God's spice. So we know that Shakespeare loves puns. And here he's saying that God spies, right, the recusant Catholics and the priests and the Jesuits, the God spies are also God's spice. They are being crushed, but mm. in being crushed in the beauty of their martyrdom, they are rising like incense to heaven. Now, how about like the timing of some of his, like on a, on a pig picture, some of his plays, for example, wasn't it Macbeth that came out after uh, the gunpowder plot? And doesn't that, re I think I remember, I think something you wrote uh, talking about that kind of reflects the fact that there was this hope when James I first became king, that the better days were coming for Catholics. But then it all fell apart. And then you see that in the somewhat uh, really unrelenting tragedy of Macbeth. Yeah. In fact, I'm really pleased you asked that question because this is one of the strongest pieces of textual evidence we have. So King James VI of Scotland, the, 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 uh, who was uh, an, a, a Protestant, a Church of Scotland, so... Um, uh, but his mother, of course, was uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, a devout Catholic. He promised that when he became king, he would uh, uh, do away with religious intolerance and allow Catholics to practice their faith freely. He made that promise. So the Catholics in England were just hanging on in there. The queen was getting older and they knew she couldn't hold on forever. We just have to hang on in there because when she dies, and King James VI of Scotland becomes King James I of England, all will be well. So uh, they wait for that to happen. When King James becomes king, he keeps his promise. There's a brief honeymoon period after he becomes king when Catholics can practice their faith. And everybody's astonished at how many Catholics there are because they come out of the woodwork and their Catholicism is being practiced everywhere. But by this time, Parliament is becoming dominated by the Puritans. Uh, who, of course, hate Catholicism and will not tolerate Catholicism. You know, 40 years later, they would actually uh, over, overpower the king in the, the Civil War and uh, King Charles I would be executed by them. So they're rising in power and they say, we will not tolerate your tolerance of the Catholics. And so King James I, in a true Machiavellian fashion, weighs it up. Who has the most power? Parliament? or the Catholics. And he says, OK, obviously, Parliament has the power. I'm going to do what Parliament wants. And he brings back all of the anti-Catholic laws. Now, we have to imagine, try to put yourself in the position of Catholics in England at the time. They've been living for, you know, waiting for Queen Elizabeth I to die so that they could be free and liberated again. And then they get a taste, just a taste of freedom. And then just for about 10 months or so. And then it is taken away. And now we have a young king on the throne who could reign for another 40 years with no prospect of, uh, of, of religious liberty. So this, this is the point when many Catholics surrender. They, they, they say, we can't continue to pay the fines. Uh, we've done the best we can, and they conform. 
but the other extreme of the, of the spectrum are the hotheads who say at this point the only the only thing we can do is violence. Uh, we can only over overcome uh, the persecution by over by destroying the government, and that's why the gunpowder plot uh, is is uh, comes to fore at that time. Um, and we, we know that the gunpowder plot it was probably instigated by hot-headed Catholics, but the spy network knew about it straight away. And rather than arresting people, the spies were involved in the whole conspiracy. That's why they managed to get the gunpowder right under Parliament so that they can maximise the impact of, of exposing it just when the, you know, the fuse is about to be lit to, to, to have the maximum impact in terms of anti-Catholicism. So that's the situation. Now, how, where, where does Shakespeare fit into all of this? We imagine, right? We have these angry plays like the Hamlet, which we mentioned towards the end of Elizabeth's reign. When Elizabeth dies, the two plays he writes about this time, about this time, one is All's Well That Ends Well, and we'll let the title speak for itself. Right. <laughs> uh, and the other is Measure for Measure, which has a very uh, basically uh, warning the king of not to trust the Puritans. And, and the heroine is a, is a religious sister. Um, so this is probably the most overtly Catholic play Shakespeare wrote. But then after that, what comes after that? Othello, uh, King Lear, and Macbeth, both the darkest and the angriest of Shakespeare's plays with the possible exception of Hamlet. So Othello, who is the villain, uh, the satanic villain, the Machiavel, Iago. Iago is the Spanish name for James. And in the source material that Shakespeare, you know, most of Shakespeare's plays, he just takes it, sources already exist and then does his thing with them. <laughs> in the source play for Othello, uh, the, the, the villain is not called Diego. Shakespeare changes his name to James. So this Machiavellian vi villain in Othello is, is one of the most demonic characters that Shakespeare creates is named after the King of England. Then we have Macbeth. Well, we've already talked about King Lear, so I shall desist. I could say more, but but then we have Macbeth. Now, Macbeth's a play about a Scottish king, all right? Uh, so it, it, for Shakespeare's contemporary, there's no doubt at all what's going on here. Yago is James, Macbeth is James. And I could, again, say much more, but I think that it succinctly shows what Shakespeare's doing here. Right. I mean, it just shows a certain amount of, I don't know if I want to say depression, but just a real sense of that things are not going to all's well all's well is not going to end well <laughs> yeah i mean best the darkest of the plays but what what i try to say here however is that we should see hamlet as the anti macbeth and macbeth is the anti hamlet because mm -hmm. hamlet starts in despondency and near despair contemplating suicide and then through the use of reason and virtue such as temperance and prudence not acting hastily, not being rash, um, comes eventually to an acknowledgement of the gospel, quoting the gospel directly, and then laying down his life for his friends. He is the innocent victim, in some sense the Christ figure, who purges the something rotten from Denmark. And of course, Denmark, again, is a euphemism for England. The other thing you should know, by the way, it's all important stuff, this, <laughs> that Shakespeare, that it, was, it was known that Shakespeare's history plays were seen as, as anti Elizabeth and pro-Catholic. So on the eve of the Essex Rebellion, his play, uh, Richard II, was performed in the hope that it would help the people rise up against the Queen. So in order to stop this Shakespeare using English history as a way of, um, of furthering the Catholic cause, it was made illegal. It's called the Bishop's Ban, the bishops of the Anglican Church were behind it. Um, but it, it became illegal to write plays about English history. And that was in the 1590s. So what happens after that? Shakespeare writes plays uh, either set in Rome or, or in Scotland. Um, so in other words, he just, he just gets around the band by doing the same thing, but setting it other, other than English history, in this case, in Macbeth's Scottish history. So, um, so Macbeth is the other way around. Uh, you know, that he uh, begins as a hero, lauded by everybody, uh, and then through satanic temptation and... Uh, uh, prideful ambition descends to at the end far from far from uh, embracing the gospel he he has a radical nihilistic um uh 
uh, belief that, uh, that nothing signifies anything, right? You know, life is a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Nihilism. And again, secular scholars, I'd have heard this. I don't know if you know, there's a wonderful series. I know I'm jumping about here. <laughs> it's okay. Of, there's a wonderful series which I recommend uh, that uh, prefigures, if you like, Bishop Barron's series called Civilization by Sir Kenneth Clark. And it was late 60s in England, and I recommend it. But the worst episode in it of all is the one on Shakespeare, because Sir Kenneth Clark's an art historian. He's in his element talking about art. He's not his element talking about literature. And he ends his, his, his episode on Shakespeare by saying Shakespeare's the first nihilist. And then he quotes these words from Macbeth, right? And we have to uh, understand, right, that Shakespeare never said that. He wrote that. The person who says it is Macbeth, right? right? This person has been in league with the devil who's a serial killer, uh, <laughs> who basically is left with nothing but despair at the end. And it's almost like he's saying that's what James, that's where James is going because he started off, this is our savior. This is the person who's going to bring Catholicism back to the country. And then through his Machiavellian actions, just like Macbeth, he ends up basically giving it all up. And it's almost like Shakespeare's telling James, this is where you're headed. And this is what your life is headed towards. If you don't end up like Hamlet, you're going to end up like Macbeth, which is completely uh, nihilistic, as you said. Absolutely. And in terms of pure real politic as well, of course, it would actually mean that his own son would be murdered uh, by the very people that James had sold his soul for, the Puritans. So there was also an element not just of the, this this uh, deep theological and philosophical understanding of human the human psyche, which you've just addressed, but also this real politic that, you know, if you're going to get in, if you're going to get in bed with the devil, don't don't expect to, don't expect to come out the other side very clean or even alive. Uh, the other thing I want to say about Hamlet and Macbeth, by the way, is you'll notice as the parallel they both begins with a supernatural uh, 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 dimension. So in uh, Hamlet, there is the ghost of his father, who's in purgatory, uh, and you know, Hamlet does says what if, what if he's lying? What if he's a demon telling me lies? That, you know, that's tell, telling me that my uncle murdered him just to get me to kill my uncle. So he, he he tests whether it's an honest ghost. And that's where he has to play the mousetrap. What's the purpose of the play? To uh, reveal the truth, right? Um, and so the, that, that's really Shakespeare's talked about the role, his own role in society, in the role of the play in Hamlet. But the ghost is honest. The ghost is a Catholic ghost in purgatory uh, and listening to that Catholic ghost and acting upon it brings about justice. In Macbeth, Macbeth listens to demons, to diabolical uh, half tellers of truth or tellers of half truths. <laughs> um, you know, and again, you know, there, there, there's, there's lies, damn lies and half truths. Right. Um, so, you know, that that's what Macbeth believes the devil and ends up in hell. Um, Hamlet prudently tests whether the ghost is really in purgatory, which means, of course, he's on his way to heaven, uh, that, uh, and then acts, acts in accordance with that honesty and brings about justice and goes to heaven. Again, yeah. the final word said over, over Hamlet's body by his, by his uh, servant uh, is, um, Horatio, is, um, may flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. And again, the what's significance, these are it's a translation of the Latin of the prayers said for the dead immediately after a requiem mass, which was illegal at the time that those words were being said by Horatio. It's just like the Catholicism just seeps through. It's even if he's not trying, probably it's just he can't help himself in a sense, because that's just who he is. Now, I want to finish here with kind of the question of why does this matter? And I'm particularly thinking of maybe there's uh, parents who are watching this who homeschool their kids and are teaching their kids Shakespeare or younger people learning Shakespeare in college. Why does it matter for our reading of Shakespeare today to understand this religious background of, of Shakespeare himself? Well, first of all, of course, in, in, the, in the broadest and absolute sense, um, great art is a reflection of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Uh, and I think when Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth and the life, he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm the good, the true and the beautiful. So great art is itself a reflection of the goodness, truth and beauty of God. So that in itself should be sufficient. But beyond that, um, that 
Shakespeare is living in very anti-Catholic times where the secular power is being used to uh, bully, browbeat uh, uh, the Catholics into accepting the culture of the day, the secular culture of the day. Uh, and uh, living in, a, in, a, in a, um, a time where religious liberty is being taken away, where the practice of religion is frowned upon and, and even punished. Now, that is, uh, that's been a recurring theme throughout the history of, of the church. There are times, in fact, at, at all times, the secular powers in, in a state of tension with the church. And at certain times, the secular power becomes anti-Christian enough and powerful enough to do what it did in Elizabethan and Jacobean England. And we, it's, we, we've seen it in the 20th century. We've seen it in various, you know, the Nazi uh, Germany, various communist countries, uh, the French Revolution, before that, Mexico in the last century. This is something which is a recurring feature. We have to learn the lessons that history and art teaches us. And there's no greater teacher in terms of history and art than William Shakespeare. Yeah, absolutely. Amen to that. Now, I want to recommend a few things for, I'll, I'll put you notes all this. Of course, there's this book, The Quest for Shakespeare, The Bard of Avon and the Church of Rome, which is basically the biographical evidence more than anything of why Shakespeare was Catholic. You mentioned that, and this is from Ignatius Press, you mentioned there was two other books on Shakespeare that you wrote for Ignatius. Is that right? And what are those? Yeah, so the follow-up to that one was called Through Shakespeare's Eyes. I do have that. I, ha I haven't read that yet, but I do have that sitting over in my bookshelf. And the subtitle of that is Seeing the Catholic Presence in the Plays. That's also Ignatius. And the third one is Shakespeare on Love, um, uh, Seeing the Catholic Presence in Romeo and Juliet. And uh, so it's all on that one play. But that's the one where has got a quite a lengthy 30-page appendix on the Jesuit connection, uh, which is, uh, yeah. I think, interesting itself. And also, I'm the series editor of the Ignatius Critical Editions. And there were 27 titles, uh, great works of literature in that series, uh, it, which includes seven Shakespeare plays, each of which has an introduction by me and then also a, 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 a selection of good, solid uh, literary criticism, critical essays about the plays. So I would recommend those also. Right. I was going to recommend this as well. Those, particularly for Shakespeare, obviously the whole critical edition series is great. But those seven books on Shakespearean plays are excellent. In fact, just so people know what I'm doing, like when I'm reading through them, what I do is I'll, I'll read the play. I think I have like the Folger copy already. We had this. So I read the play. Uh, and then what I do is I go to your critical edition. I read, you know, read your introduction. I read the, the contemporary analysis afterwards by some great people uh, who are seeing it as they should in the more traditional way, in a more Catholic way. And then I go back and read the play again. Because then it's like, okay, now I can see it with new eyes. I can understand kind of what you're talking about by having read it once. But now I can really, and, and, and then it's just, it's been great. And so I recommend that to anybody. But particularly also if you're, if you're schooling your kids and you're hitting Shakespeare, definitely get the Ignatius critical editions um, of, of his plays. They're, they're just excellent. I, I know you have the four great tragedies, and I'm not sure what the other three. Well, I, th I, 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 I can, yes, yeah, so I can name the seven seven quickly i think so it's julius caesar the merchant of venice hamlet othello macbeth um king lear and i knew there had to be one i was going to forget the, the, yeah, romeo and juliet is that romeo it? and juliet if i didn't mention romeo and juliet that's the other one and yeah. uh, one thing i would say most of those also have uh for, for particularly for homeschooling parents a study guide um, which which uh, which is would be invaluable for for homeschooling parent and that they have a de um, what's the word a detachable uh, answer uh, pages okay. so that uh, you, the, the parent can set essay questions and general knowledge questions and have discussion questions they're all in there so that's another resource if people want to teach Shakespeare uh, to look check out the study guides that accompany the critical editions now is the critical edition series over is there any plans to add any more to that series do you know yeah, there are plans. It, I, I would say it's it stalled somewhat, but but the the the, the uh, position of both myself as series editor and Ignatius Press, the publishers, that we are intending to publish more titles in the series. Uh, there are one or two in the works, but they're moving through, trudging through slowly. Right, exactly. Well, I'll just put in my two cents, add more Shakespeare plays then. <laughs> well, right, that's my vote. So, OK, well, great. Now, uh, what can people find out about uh, the different things you're working on? 
Well, the best place to keep up with me is to go to my personal website, and that's a very simple, jpierce.co. And if you don't know how to spell my name, J-P-E-A-R-C-E dot C-O. So that's my personal website. That's where you keep up with all I'm up to, podcasts, uh, uh, essays, uh, and the rest. Great. And I'll put a link to that as well. And also, just for people who aren't, aren't aware, is that Joseph, for the past year and a half, been, has been writing an In the Nutshell series about all the great works of literature. Uh, they're great. In fact, it was funny when I was reading, started reading the Shakespeare, I went back to re- reread uh, what you had written there. But those are nice little snippets, uh, not real long, but to give you an overview of the, the great works of literature. And we're in the 20th century now, so we're nearing the end. We started a long time ago, but now we're nearing the end. And I think it's been a great series. Um, so I also recommend people... Uh, check that out as well. So, okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for being on the program. This is great. This is very, I, I found it very uh, stimulating and exciting and uh, I appreciate you uh, sharing it all with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Eric. Okay, everybody. Until next time. God love you.